Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, when we last left our reusable space program, we had had the Moonlifter come and rescue the Keithane mining rig, which in turn had then had to rescue the lifting rig due to a fuel inadequacy situation. But anyway, we get these guys back into space and, and put them back on the on the on the moon station Artemis, basically. Uh, there's a bit of uh, problems here because we're really we're really having issues with docking nodes. We at one end we have the we had the the lander which I lifted up in a scene which you did not see. I did not record, but I did return the lander to the uh, spacecraft to the station. And uh, so because the far end of the the lifting rig has the winch attached, the keythane rig has to dock onto the other end of the station while we wait for essential supplies from the planet Kerbin. Now, what supply? What a... One wonders what those sub form those supplies must take. Well, we will find out, obviously. But uh, this one does not dock rather nicely. I'm just uh, skipping over most of the boring bits, but there's a lot of docking. The problem I'm wanting to stress here is that we have a real parking situation out at the Artemis station. Uh, you see that we have three spacecraft docked onto two ports. Actually, we have four because we have the little, um, the little probe tug there. What is coming, of course, from the planet Kerbin is this big space train. You see that it is pulling its load behind it like a train and using the amazing B9 cockpit. Whereas we turn to point retrograde, we can take a look out at the planet Kerbin, get a nice view of the place from whence we have come. Look at that, even at this distance it still looks beautiful. I can only imagine how beautiful that will look when we finally get clouds one day. Anyway, uh, you know, we'll kind of continue doing the whole docking routine. Uh, this, the main reason for the space tug, of course, is to move fuel back and forth between uh, the Artemis station and the Olympus station in Kerbin orbit. We need something that can move a reasonable amount, and those two large tanks there, or those two medium-sized tanks, I guess, will move enough to fill one of the or those orange tanks. So we'll need six of these runs to fill up the current, the potential capacity of, of the station, of the Olympus station. Anyway, uh, just approaching the Artemis station here, just trying to get in nice and close. Of course, using the using the nav ball entirely to adjust this. Notice the glitch there, or the pause as we come around and it loads the it loads the models. And we're just gonna try and get in as close as possible and then park this because this thing really is far too unwieldy to dock on its own. There we go. We're just gonna try and zero out the velocity and then we'll just uh park it there and let the spacecraft on the Artemis station do the business. So here we are, 30 kilometers up, parked 100 meters away from the Artemis station. And what we're going to do is bring out the... We have to do this in two stages. We have to bring out the lifter rig, because it has to grab one end, and then we will bring out the Keithane rig to grab the other end. And you'll see why. Uh, what's on the end there is the docking adapter and a little spare fuel tank. And the spare fuel tank will end up going onto the onto the keythane rig so that it can actually manufacture fuel while it is on the surface. Assuming that works. Ah, but here we go. Just coming down to dock. And Yeah, somebody said this spacecraft looks like a Star Fury. The only thing is the cockpit is in completely the wrong place. And those big engines there really shouldn't should be like six-way engine clusters. But other than that, yeah, I'd love to be able to build a Star Fury in Kerbal Space Program. Maybe we'll get the bits for it. However, if you have been paying attention to the dev blogs, you will see that uh, C7 is working on wheels, official support for wheels, so you can build your own rovers. They're going to have... Um, they're going to work up to a certain speed as powered wheels, and then beyond that you can push it with other systems. And if you go too fast, there's a chance of them breaking. And he even says that he'd like to have the ability for Kerbals to replace the wheels in space, or wherever they are. So there we go. So we get this, and now we pull the whole thing off, and that is now the new docking adapter for the station. But 
there's one extra piece there that we need to grab off of this first. Uh, and that what well, that is what the Keithin miner is going to grab. We're just going to move it in a little closer again. Because any two objects in space will tend to float away from each other, just if they're in orbit. Um, I mean, there's not really much out, what much you can do about it. No matter how well you park it, eventually it will begin to float away. Um, or collide. <laughs> uh, that's the only, the only case where it won't float away is if it actually bumps into the other one. But then after colliding, it will begin to float away again. So don't, you know, worry about spending too much time holding position. The, holding position relative to an object in space is one of the hardest things that uh, at pilots do in the space program. Uh, if you look at the space shuttle for, you know, for operations where it was going to sit close to the space station but not dock, they actually had planned that they would grab uh, each other using the robot arms. Because uh, a physical link means things are a whole lot better. Okay, so now the Keith N. Lander needs to go over and grab the little fuel tank off the front of that uh, that assembly there, basically, while the, the tug lander holds position. Now, uh, the other thing that was mentioned about uh, point 0.19, which uh, we don't have a date on that, by the way. But this is entirely in development. But the big thing that came out was the resource diagram. Now, all this messing around with Keithane is kind of child's play compared to what we're actually going to have. They're going to have multiple resources, raw resources that can be mined on all the planets and ultimately converted into things. Now, they're not using real names, and apparently people complain about this. I'm not sure. They're going to use tr things like propellium that gets turned into liquid fuel, oxium that turns into oxidizer nitronite, water, plutonium, hexogen, zeonium. All this stuff is going to come together and let you create the materials that you use to fuel your entire space program. So here we go, we're just going to grab this, and nice. Now drop that off there, and uh, yeah, don't go forward. <laughs> Bit of an accident there. Lucky I didn't lose a, a solar panel there. These things are pretty tough. Yeah, so, you know, you'll be able to scoop stuff. There's a new thing called a hydro scoop that lets you scoop materials from oceans. So you can get, a, you can get apparently plutonium from a Eve's ocean. Plutonium being the, one of the things that's used to make nuclear fuel. So that apparently confirms that Eve's oceans are in fact slightly radioactive. You can also scoop fuel from Eve's oceans as well. Uh, although where you're going to get the oxidizer, that's a different question. Uh, you can generally mine dirt from anywhere, apparently, and dirt can be made into everything. There's a little HMU uh, refinery thing. It's a module which takes electricity and it produces small amounts of everything. So apparently, you know, you'll never be stranded assuming you have power and a rock drill and one of these refineries. So anyway, yeah. We're now going to dock on the, the docking adapter onto the station so we can finally solve some of our parking problems. And as we're going in, we're, you see as a, it's a little unwieldy. It has some extra jets on it, extra RCS, and that is actually making it really squirrely. And in fact, when I'm hitting stabilizer, yeah, I run out of monoprop, basically. So now I'm floating next to my station, once again, without fuel. Uh, in the previous mission, it ran out of, of rocket fuel for the main engines. Now it has run out of monopropellant. So, uh, these guys, apparently, they're not very good at checking... They're not very good at checking their fuel loads. However, they have apparently trained for this eventuality. So I'm, we're going to attempt a, a straight-up docking using just main engines. It is not going to be pretty. It is going to definitely rely on the on the stickiness of these docking ports without it I, i'm not sure how possible it would be it certainly doesn't end up being anywhere as near as pretty as the one that i did in my apollo mission but uh yeah you see me just kind of trying to kill my lateral velocity and give myself forward velocity in the right direction and it's very hard because of course there we go we get a touch there and then like, we're just wobbling around like crazy. And so when you're wobbling around, uh, turn on the stabilizer periodically, and that will try and kill your lateral motion. But then make sure you turn the darn thing off, because 
Look at this station, it's now wobbling around like a piece of spaghetti, a piece of wet spaghetti even. Anyway, now we can uh, bring our fuel tanker in and dock it. It really is just an episode full of me docking very unwieldy ships. <laughs> uh, I promise you there will be more interesting stuff coming up. We need to have a launch. I think it's important that we have a launch in every single episode. So yeah, this is going to try and dock onto one of those lateral ports. And I'm going to make a point of trying to use the use the cockpit view to help line things up. It is really nice, even if you can't perform the complete docking. And I'm just like floating around here trying to figure out my rotation. Uh, I'm, I'm just like a whale flopping around in the <laughs> water like, Where can I say I can't find the space station? Okay. <laughs> There we go, we're trying to get things lined up. There! Oh, look at that beautiful planet there. Okay, so we're lined up and we're just going to try and aim for the docking ports. Uh, thankfully, this spacecraft is rather stable and it does have a lot of RCS fuel here. Like, we're just going to move things around and I'm going to try and get down on towards the, the main docking ring here. There is the lander. The lander is not getting a lot of use. I mean, it delivered a couple of pieces before we realized that we needed something heavier duty. I'm not sure what I can actually use it for anymore, really. Oh, got a weird... Something's rotating. Uh, the space station has just started rotating on me. Randomly. So, uh, yeah, just put this thing back to where it was. Again, it wobbling like a piece of, of jelly or something. Thanks, though, to... Uh, Time acceleration, we can ar at least arrest the wobbling. There we go. I'm just trying to aim for that docking ring, so we need to kind of bring the spacecraft around a little. I'm going to go for that one there. And it takes a little bit of effort. I mean, the cockpit view is actually really good for lining the stuff up. But it's not quite so good for actually hitting the port, because the port is offset. People said, by the way, that there is a uh, an adapter that gives you like a centralized port. The only adapter I can see gives me a two and a half meter port, or two and a half meter plate, which I don't want because it means that I can't see anything out the front of the ship. There we go. Come on, you're gonna get on there. Worst docking ever, huh? Again, it looks like a uh, large sea mammals mating. Oh, there we go. That's us docked. Look at that now. Now let us bring our Keithane Minor down to the surface. Oh, yeah, hit the question mark there. I tried to use land at target. Land at target doesn't work on the moon. I don't know what's going on, uh, but it would be really nice since I'm going to have to be doing a lot of these trips. <laughs> Instead, I have to pretty much land or get myself close to the target manually, and I'm using the... using Scraper as my target here. You can see I'm going to overshoot a little, but I'll just burn a little extra and come back round. There we go. And now from there, we're just going to hit the land button and the land will put us on the surface. There we go. Look at that. Mechanical jab at four times normal speed. Ha! Huh. So now, ha 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 ha, finally, we have a 100% functional Keithane mining system on the moon at last. Oh my goodness. Ah. So anyway, we need to launch something new, and given that we have our fuel supply figured out, we are going to start looking at other planets, so we're going to launch space probes everywhere. Now, I tried very hard to build a, an ion probe that would go all the way, uh, would basically be launchable in the back of the Raven, but unfortunately it has too many issues with the mass. And when you fire up the main engines, it just wants to rotate around. And I tried various solutions. I tried building counterweights and everything, so, but it didn't work. So instead, we are using the main reusable launcher, but we're going to get more bang for our buck. We're going to put four of these probes on them. And, well, that is at least one probe for every planet. We might send one to Moho, or we might send two to Jewel. We're not sure. I guess we have also Elu as well. Um, I'm not sure, They're, they've got four, four Xenon tanks, so they actually have a pretty high amount of Delta V. I'm not sure if they have enough to get into orbit around Moho, but I think, I, I think they do. So we'll find out. Not that reusable space program is going to Moho anytime soon, but maybe that should be my ultimate goal, is to 
land people on the surface of every single planet before uh, 0.19 comes out. Wouldn't that be awesome? So what we're doing here is we're putting it into we put it into a much lower periapse, like 77, and then we burned all our fuel to get ourselves into an eccentric orbit. Now, when we come out the other side, that's when we're going to deploy these things because they need to have power. You don't want to deploy them on the dark side of the planet when they don't have any solar power. With the ginormous solar panels, you need a bit of clearance with them. Uh, they actually are wide enough, but they will turn and, and explode if they smash into the, the, into the rocket. But look at that. Ion power looks so much better when it's firing at, at a four times speed, huh? <laughs> four of these. We're going to have to come up with names for these. So, um, yeah, suggest names for the video, for the, the probes. If you have some good probes, uh, good names, we might use them. Uh, drop them in the comments, please. Might even be some prizes. Who knows? There we go. Just bringing these out. Getting ready for their voyage to uh, distant worlds. Uh, due to a misplanning, a planning issue, I guess, I managed to put their periaps on the night side, so I can't quite take advantage of the Oberth effect. I'm going to have to just go out slowly, spiral out, and then hit up whatever I can. But there we go. I think that's us. Four space probes, and they're going to accelerate out. Here's one that's been accelerating for, well, 30 minutes or so. You see it's already beyond the moon's orbit. It has a long way to go, but we know that it has the patience, and I hope that you guys have the patience and will come back for later episodes. Until then, I am Scott Manley. Fly safe.